Timing team fights properly so that you keep the cart moving in an overtime situation, or stop it when the enemy team seemingly are pushing the cart forever with no time left on the board. Both has specific sets of rules that go about how to navigate playing them and I want to go over those situations here today. What's going on everybody? It's Frito here for your Overwatch and since they instituted the new overtime mechanic it's really become common that on a lot of maps if both teams were able to finish there's a big chance by that point they developed whatever strategy they can utilize or counter from your team to be able to have a quite significant second go at it when they get the chance. So I find when I'm in games where the map is completed, it always feels like you're a few team fights away from doing it again, even with no time on the board. Well, how does this work? And what are the things to make sure that you look out for when you're trying to defend against this? And how do you use it to your advantage to try to complete an entire map with no time? There's no shame in having it happen to you. The pro team Rogue representing France in the World Cup got Hollywood completed on them twice, but to their credit, they did come back and match the scoreline and in fact beat it. So it's clear that it happens to the best of them, but something that you have to remember that if one team has a few minutes on the board and the other team just has one minute, which is the minimum they can get, it isn't as big of an advantage as you think because you can utilize these tactics that I'm gonna go over here today. First and foremost, on the first engagement, you wanna be careful not to make a big mistake because there really isn't any time to regroup and if the enemy get any ults churning, they're definitely going to win. So you don't wanna extend out in any sort of poke battle, trading damage back and forth, feeding ults on either team, don't do any of that. As the attacking team in this scenario, you wanna be precise without overstepping too hard or too quickly because you never know what might be waiting around a corner. Try to take a look around to see how the enemy is set up. Don't have a lot of time, of course, because they'll be shooting you in the face, but for all you know, they might have a surprise Torb set up in some goofy location that can just win the round if you actually run through it, or maybe a Reaper set up in a corner somewhere lets you pass and wins the entire fight by popping your support in the head when you're not paying attention. Check things out. Don't be afraid to be a little reserved when taking stock of the enemy team's team comp and where they're set up. And when your team has calls for focus fire, get them done quickly so that you can snowball the fight. Really, every team engagement should work this way in general for the most part. Unless, of course, you know what the enemy team has so that you don't have to do the wait around and think about it for a second maneuver. But ideally, every engagement is taken with this type of care. So really, this isn't anything new. The next step after presumably winning the first team fight and setting up yourself for an overtime push is looking to stall characters in transition. What the gameplay showed on screen, the enemy have good spawns for the streets hold anyway. Most of their team is set up for all I know around the corner. But if they went for a last minute contest on the first point, then we won it. You have to remember how terrible it is for the enemy defense to lose that fight, then be sent all the way to the far spawn. The tug of war battle on the spawns is very important. The enemy team here did do something pretty smart, and when they knew that the first hybrid point was going to be captured, they didn't just throw their bodies onto it to try to stop us from getting one point. Instead, they were satisfied with trying to take another clean engagement around the corner, with all their team there, because if they didn't do that and their spawns were either spread out or much farther, we either would simply get more cart before the next engagement comes, or even worse, go chase after them in the street section to try to trickle the team fight even more to get even more distance without a full team engage. The reason why the trickling strategy is often what you want to look to do is because if the enemy team do any sort of coordinated ult onto the cart at the same time, even if it doesn't really kill you, if it's enough to get you off the cart for even a second, the round is over then and there. But what the defense absolutely cannot do is throw out their ults in an uncoordinated way so that they're constantly trying to make hero plays on the cart rather than concisely winning a single team fight. Remember, it does not matter how many kills you get with that Genji Blade or Diva Bomb if your team still loses the fight and the enemy still has one character on cart. That's all that matters, is setting up to clear the cart entirely, even if you have to over-ult like you've never over-ulted before. Oftentimes it's a strategy I hear in matchmaking, and it's one that I agree with entirely, and that's to wait to use all your ults at the same time, which is exactly what we're going to do on our defense. Now the enemy does finally find some purchase on their ultimates, but really we got all the way to the door of the final point, so they can't be satisfied with their defense in this scenario. Granted, going on to defense second here does give us a bit of an advantage because we're able to know what team fights actually matter. And the secret is the only one that matters is the last one when the time runs out. 
Anything we do to just lose slowly, which is a concept in Overwatch, and it's kind of a weird thing to say out loud, but it's actually a strategy that defenders use. And by losing slowly, you can stall the cart's progress out enough without winning a fight ever. And then when you know it matters in overtime, you can cash in your one free ultimate teamfight win by popping all your Qs at once. Because, of course, if you use your ults through the round, and they haven't run out of time yet, there's always a chance that they regroup, get back on the cart, and then have infinite time. So by that logic, you really only want to be using your ults if you feel like you're going to be winning the team fight. Of course, it matters how much time's left, because if there's a lot of it, you're going to have to figure out how to get your ultimates churning and being very efficient with them, whereas if you know the overtime meter is close to coming up, you can just save them for that fight, win the fight that's in overtime, and then win the entire game from there. There's no benefit really to winning a fight earlier in the round if you can simply just wait for the overtime to come. It's kind of a weird mechanic and probably isn't the most competitive way to approach the game, but it's the benefit that you get for pushing the cart quite far. Because of course, if you don't cap first in this scenario on Numbani, you won't have the luxury to be able to know they have to push it miles and miles away. So although it in some ways is an unfair advantage, it is a earned advantage that you had to, of course, play well and then play badly and then fail to get you off the cart in the proper way in order for you to be able to leverage it against your opponent. Now let's use these principles that we've learned and apply them to the France-Denmark game, which has received quite a bit of buzz for it going into multiple overtimes, kind of a rare thing to happen in competitive Overwatch. And the reason being is because these fundamentals are quite tried and true in terms of how to counteract these types of problems. So let's set the stage where we're at right now. There's probably a lot of mistakes back and forth that we could go over for even one overtime push to fully complete. But being on defense now with Denmark knowing that France is going to have to complete the entire map, it's their game to win at this point. On top of that, they win the first fight as well meaning that they're going to be up in ultimates, they can stabilize quite a bit. The only thing that can lose the game from this point for Denmark is some key mistakes. On top of the first fight, they win the second fight as well, but very key to note that all the while, AKM is charging up his tack visor, so even though they're losing the fight, they're quite equal in the ultimate economy, and that's just gonna go down to them having world-class players, of course. Denmark, in their defense, isn't a full pro team. The French team is just rogue, okay? So it's not really comparable. Now, it's really important to note that cashing in a team fight for three ultimates when there's only 40 seconds left is a huge mistake. I can't stress this enough. It's going to come back to haunt them tenfold, and you'll see why. What is the value of winning this fight now when you know you're going to have like five or six engagements in overtime before they even come close to reaching the distance of all three points in overtime? There is no value whatsoever to get a powerful team fight win before the clock is in overtime. And on top of that, Rogue, being a professional team, knows Half of the team on Denmark's side doesn't have their ults, so they know they're not going to have sound barrier to counteract either offensive ult from France, which guarantees that they're going to win it now. The only acceptable strategy from Denmark would be to maybe try to trade out the ults at the same time, but using them to convincingly win a fight before it's the last fight does really nothing other than give Rogue an opportunity to then just come back for their fight to cash in their free ultimate team fight win. Now, in Denmark's defense, it's hard to know the impact of highly skilled players riding the cart, because what happens is through the streets phase is Denmark barely even gets a chance to charge their ults up at all. And this is something that can take you by surprise when you're playing in your games as well. It's surprising how quickly that the enemy team can go out and trickle your respawns. Here in the streets phase, and mind you, the ult economy was so good that wins didn't have to use sound barrier to take first so that they have it for the streets phase as well. Then they win this fight convincingly also because they're able to have all of the map control as the enemy defense has to come through the entire Westworld stage to get back to the cart. They have all the information of where the enemy is coming. And then Rogue essentially is playing defense on the cart. They're the ones zoning in the defense and funneling them into all their damage so that when Denmark tries to go contest the cart, they're just getting crossfired and get obliterated. 
obliterated. Unfortunately, they had to go take care of the high ground first, ignore the cart, and win the fight convincingly, but they don't do that either. And besides, they probably would have lost to the sound barrier either way. Again, remember, all we need to do is save up enough cues to use all our cues at once. So even though the traditional logic of trying to go for odd tracer pulse bomb pickoffs doesn't really matter if the enemy team frag back. All it's going to do as the tracer player is make it difficult to find synergy points where you have your ult with the rest of your team. Their ults charge really slowly and your odd pickoffs here or there with pulse bomb aren't coming close to your win condition unless the rest of your team can find purchase with their ultimates as well. You have to know that it's okay to lose very convincing fights without having any impact in them. Because if we look back to the Rogue fight, when Denmark used three ultimates to convincingly win it, Rogue handily allow that fight to be lost. They don't try to put in ultimates to try to swing it back. They know they're going to lose it, so they just allow that to happen. And that little mistake, way back when, like minutes ago, because now the overtime is extended for minutes, costed the entire ultimate economy for Denmark to be out of whack for the rest of the round. It allowed France to be able to use their offensive ultimates to cash in a fairly easy team fight. And because they didn't waste their defensive ultimates on a losing fight that they didn't have to win anyway, when Denmark cashed in their Dragon Blade, they had it for the next fight, Street's phase took forever, and Denmark never stabilized, so they never really charged up ults efficiently. And before you know it, the last meaningful fight is at the end of the map. Whereas, imagine this crazy scenario. Let's take it all the way back to when this decision was made. What if Denmark allowed Rogue to take the point? Crazy, I know, right? Why let them have the point ever? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you have like five team fights between now and them getting to the end of the map, which you were able to reach, and the only fight that you need to win is when the time's out, because otherwise they can just respawn again and then come back at you. So if Denmark doesn't use any ults here, and even let Rogue have to use ults, okay? Rogue have to win the fight. If you're winning the early fights mechanically, win the next fight mechanically, and Rogue's gonna have to panic ults to even have a chance to win the fight. Then if you decide to, you have the decision, either let Rogue win it, let them use their resources, or then you use your resources to counteract that fight. Either of those decisions could have ended up working out for Denmark. If they trade out ultimates in the final fight of the point A take, they possibly can win. Or if they just concede and allow France to blow most of their resources, because remember, the attacking team here has to take the point. There's no reason to give them a free fight by having a big window where you're defenseless. And then if you do that, you can set up a clean multi-ultimate fight on the cart in the streets phase at one of the multiple streets phase fights you're going to get. You get like two and a half streets phase fights, you get another fight for sure by third. Any one of these fights you could potentially use to pop all your ults at once. You can look for the best opportunity to do so. You don't have to keep trying to find these clutch ultimates or these potential swing play ultimates. Forget all of that. Let those fights be losses if they be losses and instead formulate that one team fight in overtime. I'm going crazy about this, guys, because unfortunately, this is a fundamental of Overwatch and how it's played that everybody should know. It can be difficult sometimes to be able to track which team has what ultimates, but knowing not to spend three ults on a fight that doesn't matter is a lesson that's learned hard and I think quick, hopefully quickly, and hopefully the rest of you don't end up making these mistakes yourself. Rogue made a whole lot of mistakes in order to get themselves in this position, but of course the veteran team won out in this situation, and unfortunately Denmark, with the game to win, made enough mistakes to lose it. Because if you wreck your ultimate economy, all you have left is mechanical skill, and I'm sorry, but Rogue is going to beat you in that way. Rogue as a team oftentimes aren't very good in ultimate economy, it's something that they've improved on, and their mechanical skill has won them fights in the past, so they're well prepared to win that game, trust me. They've done it all the way through NA, beating them over and over again in the NA scene. They're well versed in having poor ult economy and still winning games, so the only way you probably are going to be able to beat them is with better ult economy than they have. Though, of course, with their experience in Korea, Rogue have improved immensely in this regard. If you enjoyed the video and you found it useful, please leave a rating. It really does help us out, lets us know that you're enjoying the content. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe, because we do upload each and every day, so you're going to want to hit the bell icon so that you join the notification squad, so that you get notified when our videos go live. Linked in the description, you can check out our Twitter and our Discord server, where you can interact with our community and find teammates to pair up with. That's been it for me, I've been Frito for your Overwatch, I'll see you guys next time.